Well, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy again for this uh, opportunity, the third opportunity this Lent, to be in your schools and to have the opportunity to um, uh, have conversation uh, with you. And uh, once again, I, I have some input, I have a presentation, and then I, I, I look forward to the opportunity to hear your questions and uh, to have conversation uh, with you around uh, today's uh, topic. I was happy to have the opportunity to be at York Catholic uh, yesterday and tomorrow. I'll be at McDevitt for the final of those uh, uh, special assemblies that we've been having through the generosity of stewardship of mission and faith. And that booklet that we are giving out this year, McDevitt has yet to get it, but the, you've all received it, um, the theology of his body, the theology of her body is very relevant to the topic that we're going to be uh, discussing this morning. So I hope those of you who have already received it have had an opportunity at least to look at it carefully, if not read it thoroughly. Uh, I would highly recommend that you would do that because it does give a very solid uh, Catholic perspective on the human person and our sexuality as male and female. So uh, let's begin with a, a scripture passage. Um, it seems from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia that the people there were having a problem with freedom. They uh, misunderstood the idea of what does it mean that Christ has freed us from sin and given us uh, freedom uh, to live in this world in such a way that we attain uh, the world of eternal happiness. And Paul addresses the issue of freedom in this very beautiful letter, his uh, letter to the Galatians. So uh, let's begin with uh, a reading there from there, and then we'll use that sort of as our springboard to go into this morning's topic. At chapter 5, the very beginning, and I'm going to skip around a little bit, but chapter 5, verse 1, Paul starts, Paul writes this, For freedom Christ sets us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, for you were called for freedom. But do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Heavenly Father, help us to receive these words of St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians that we might ponder them today and understand through your revelation the true nature of our human freedom, the true nature of the freedom that Christ has won for us by his death and resurrection. As we travel these final weeks of the Lenten season, help us to embrace this freedom more fully and to live in this grace of the freedom Christ has given us more faithfully. Help us to be witnesses to genuine human freedom and help us along the paths to accompany all of our brothers and sisters who are still searching for the true meaning of their freedom. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for pray us. For in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, you can see Paul is giving a reflection there on freedom, and I think that that is kind of the bedrock foundation of the topic that we want to talk about today, because I could ask uh, you, what, what's your notion of freedom? What does it mean for the human person to be free? And I think we live at a time and in a culture where many, many people think freedom simply is the license to do what I want. Uh, that really comes from, uh, if you recall, our first session this Lent was on faith and reason. We talked a little bit about the dramatic cultural societal shift in philosophy and theology that came about uh, in the 18th century through the French Revolution, where the human person becomes the measure of all things. Okay? Uh, things are what I want them to be, and my reason is supreme. My, my ability to analyze and to think is really uh, the bottom line on reality. And, and so if that's true, which it's not, uh, but if that were true, 
then freedom is to be able to do what I want to do, what I desire to do. And there are many uh, around us who believe, and there's much uh, in the world around us, and that's an engine, I would say, that drives a lot of the things we see happening in the world today. A lot of the cultural change, societal change, is driven by this false notion of human freedom. So it's, it's important, if we get that right, to know what Paul was trying to tell the uh, Galatians. He said, if, if you misunderstand the true nature of the freedom that we've been given in Christ, we fall into a slavery. And that's a, really a slavery to myself. I become a slave of my own will, of my own desires, of my own passions. And that's not freedom. Okay? Christ has set us free from that. And so that for the Christian, and I don't just mean the Catholic, but for the Christian who we believe in the words of Jesus, to be free is to do what the Father wills for us. I think we'd have to say that Jesus was the freest person who ever walked the face of the earth. And he kept constantly telling us he came for one reason, to do what the Father willed him to do. And so his obedience, his submission to the Father's will, gave him genuine freedom. And so it is with us when we understand God's will and by God's grace try to accomplish that will as we pray in the Lord's Prayer all of the time, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is that place where God's will is perfectly done. But the more uh, earth can do the will of God, the more earth resembles uh, the eternal life of heaven. And that's the whole purpose of the kingdom of God come among us in Jesus. So with that kind of uh, scriptural uh, theological foundation. Uh, today I wanted to talk about the topic, why is the church anti-gay people? Uh, and I said, let's talk about it. That was the way I, I phrased this. And it's a little charged because um, that topic brings together a lot of uh, factors. Uh, there's a lot of feelings involved in what we understand regarding same-sex attraction. Uh, there's a lot of emotion uh, there's the idea that if you disagree with a person, you're hating the person. In fact, uh, you know, I, I uh, like to spend time with the uh, candidates for confirmation before the mass, and uh, a, a few times I got the question phrased this way, why does the Catholic Church hate gay people? Uh, that's a very strong statement, but it, it also, I think, represents the strong emotion that some people uh, read into the church's position. So what I would uh, like to do is let the voice of the church speak for itself today, not just my own ideas, but, but to actually quote some of the church's documents regarding our attitude toward the gay person. Now we've got to make a distinction here. Right? There's the person who feels and even maybe perhaps behaves with same-sex attraction, and then there is the, the feeling, the orientation. There's the person and then there's the behavior. And I'm going to say that we need to separate those. And I'm also going to look at a major change that we've seen in our culture where the two are bound together under the words bigotry and tolerance and intolerance. And you can see that in the way things are written about today, and especially in the United States and other countries as well. So, what do we say about the person with same-sex attraction? Well, the U.S. bishops have a, a wonderful statement uh, that was uh, issued actually in 2006. It's called Ministry to Persons with Homosexual Inclination. Okay. To identify someone as homosexual, and some people will do that for themselves and say, I am homosexual, um, is really to reduce the wonder, the mystery of a human person to one aspect of our being. Uh, and that's why the title of this even tells us something. Ministry to persons with inclinations that are homosexual. Uh, our sexuality is a very important part of our lives, huh? uh, but it's also one aspect of our lives. And when someone says, I'm gay, you know, uh, that reduces me to my sexual uh, reality. But there's a whole wealth of other dimensions to the human person. So the church resists of saying, this is a homosexual person. It's a person, a person 
with inclinations toward same-sex attraction. By the way, I forgot to introduce and welcome. We have uh, seniors here from Trinity High School. I should have done that right off the start. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to have you with us here in our uh, gorgeous studio as we uh, do this morning's uh, conference. So, so there's an important distinction just in the title, Ministry to Persons with Homosexual Inclination. And here's what uh, it, it says here, the commission of the church to preach the good news to all people in every land points to the fundamental dignity possessed by each person as created by God. God has created every human person out of love and wishes to grant him or her eternal life in the communion of the Trinity. You know, Pope Benedict had a beautiful statement when he talked about the human person. No one of us is a mistake. Now, God didn't make an error when he created you, when he created you guys here, when he created me. Each one of us is an intentional creation by God, right? deliberate. So God doesn't make mistakes when he brings a human being into reality. All people are created in the image and likeness of God and thus possess an innate human dignity that must be acknowledged and must be respected. In keeping with this conviction, the church teaches that persons with homosexual inclination, see that, persons with this inclination, must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Now, where did the U.S. bishops, where did we get that, those three phrases? They actually come out of the Catholic Catechism. I'm going to take a quick look at uh, that section in our Catechism of the Catholic Church. But there's our answer. Does the church hate gay people? Is the church anti-gay? Uh, no. Every person is made in the image and likeness of God. Every person must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. A little bit more. We recognize that these persons have been and often continue to be objects of scorn, hatred, and even violence in some sectors of our society. Sometimes that hatred is manifested clearly, other times it's masked and gives rise to a more disguised form of hatred. It is deplorable that homosexual persons have been and are the object of violent malice in speech or in action. Such treatment deserves condemnation from the church's pastors wherever it occurs. Now, this document goes on in a very beautiful way, in a very sensitive, compassionate way, to say that the church, while respecting, honoring the human person with these inclinations, must disagree with the actions that are uh, homosexual. So there's a distinction that really has to be made. Um, the, the church. Uh, wants to lead us on the paths of truth, just as Paul spoke about in the letter to Galatians, on the paths of truth that lead us closer and closer to Christ so that we can come to the eternal life. First of all, be witness to the kingdom of God here on earth and then come to the fullness of that kingdom in heaven. You know, last week I talked about Pope Francis and one of the major themes of his life is accompaniment. You know, we need to accompany one another, especially those who are on the margins of society, the, the poor, the weak, the infirm, the elderly. The, um, but he always makes a distinction about accompaniment. There's nothing good about accompanying someone on the wrong road. Hmm? If, you, if you, you're walking with someone, they want to get to point A, and you know point A is behind them, and they're walking away from it. You're not being a, a, a friend if you walk along and say, well, I'm accompanying you in the wrong direction. Uh, so the church believes that Christ has set out a path for us, a moral path, and it's a rather clear one in these cases, in this case, regarding same-sex attraction. And true accompaniment means to try to lead all our brothers and sisters, respecting and accepting, but lead them in the right paths that our Lord has uh, shown to us. I like to say that the church loves everyone too much not to tell them the truth. And part of our church's moral teaching, in fact a large part of our teaching, rests on the fact that we believe we can know the truth. The truth isn't simply my subjective understanding of things. 
The truth isn't the way I feel about something. Truth is objective. And we actually have two ways of arriving at truth. And in our first session this year, we talked about faith and reason. It's often been said that God has given us two books through which we can read the truth. The first book God gave us is creation. Okay? The way we're made, the way the world, the universe, the order, the, in your science classes, the, the amazing order which exists in God's universe reflects the beauty, the wonder, the majesty of its creator. And, and so through human reason, reading the book of creation and particularly reading the book of the human person, and that's what the theology of the body is all about, the beautiful gift from Pope John Paul II, reading the beauty of the human person made in the image and likeness of God, we can come to some very clear objective truths about who we are, how we're made, what's our purpose, what's our mission, um, all, all of that through reading the book of God's creation. The second book, of course, that God gave us is the book of Scripture, huh? God's written word in the Bible. And so through faith, we approach that word as God's revelation, where we see what reason itself in creation couldn't conclude to. So the, uh, uh, the, the revelation that God has given us about himself, his love for us and our salvation in Jesus Christ brings us to a fuller grasp of the truth. And so, as I said two weeks or three weeks ago, uh, the, the faith and reason are those two wings right, that allow the human person really to, to be elevated, to fly to the full uh, understanding of what God wants us uh, to have. And so, knowing objective truth, we love people too much not to tell them the truth. And sometimes, I think in friendships, uh, we betray one another when we don't want to tell someone the truth. We know someone is behaving in such a way that's destructive, and you don't want to uh, jeopardize your friendship, and so you keep quiet. And so they're using alcohol, they're using drugs, they're behaving, in a, 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 acting out sexually. And, and you know that that isn't a, a good way to behave. It's not a way to live our lives. And yet, as a friend, you don't say anything. You're, you're accompanying that woman or man down the wrong path, uh, away from happiness, away from true freedom. Um, and, and so the church itself, as a teacher, loves every person enough to tell us the truth. And that's what happens here in this situation where we respect the person with these inclinations, but we do want them to know the truth that has been revealed to us by God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church at 2357 and the uh, several uh, paragraphs after that uh, address this question of homosexuality. And uh, it's under the second part of the Catechism, which you probably know is the Ten Commandments. And there the, uh, the Catechism expounds on the, the Ten uh, Commandments given to Moses on Sinai and applies them uh, wisely to uh, our, our, our daily lives. And uh, just to read here at, at 2357, homosexuality refers to relations between men or between women who experience an exclusive or predominant sexual attraction toward persons of the same sex. It has taken a great variety of forms through the centuries and in different cultures. Its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained. Why? How come this happens? Largely unexplained. Genetically, I just saw a little thing on television very recently uh, and an article accompanying where uh, there is no rational, scientific, genetic explanation. They've done some major studies with identical twins, both male and female, and one twin has this inclination, the other twin does not. Since their genes are so close, you would expect that both would have the inclination. So scientifically, there seems to be no objective explanation of homosexual inclination with regard to uh, our, our genes. So at an objective level, there's, there, there's more involved. And it still remains very, very mysterious uh, why it's largely unexplained. Basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as grave depravity, 
tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. So there very clearly is that distinction between the person who always uh, deserves respect and honor and then the actions of a person which can be disordered. By the way, when the catechism, we're speaking here in religious vocabulary, we're speaking here in theological vocabulary. Some people have taken a great um, uh, 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 disagreement uh, with the word disordered um, and they take it to mean something in the area of psychology. The, the catechism isn't teaching us psychology uh, and so we're not saying that homosexual, homosexuality is necessarily a psychological disorder. That's not what's being said here. It's at the level of objective morality, it's disordered, it's out of order. It is not part of the order that leads us to Christ or shows our life in Christ, but it does the opposite. That's what disorder means here. So it, says, it goes on in 2358, the number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. There's the phrase, those three words that were used by the U.S. bishops in our document. Um, Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross the difficulties they may encounter. That's a good Lenten uh, perspective, isn't it? That when we have struggles in life, and we all do, uh, and I am sure that uh, some of you are questioning your own uh, sexual identity and the orientation uh, that you're experiencing at this time, that's, in, in many cases, it's very, very normal to be somewhat confused uh, or questioning what is your real orientation. That, that's all right. You can work through that uh, with help and, uh, and, and your own uh, prayer life. It, it, it generally, for all of us, uh, uh, plays out, uh, and, uh, but there are times of confusion or disorientation uh, regarding our own sexual identity, and, and that's just part of growing to maturity. And, uh, but uh, it's important, I think, that we all uh, understand that the, the, the church's teaching uh, is that the person deserves all respect and acceptance. The behavior cannot be approved. Right? It is disordered. Um, I, I'd like to, um, I, I mentioned a, a change that we've seen. You know, but, uh, words change uh, uh, it, it, over time. Uh, they, they take on different uh, colorations. Uh, they, in fact, some words even uh, take on a totally different meaning. Uh, as they're used in a culture. Well, I, I'd like to reflect with you a, a little bit, um, and I think it's very pertinent to this topic, um, on the, the use of, of the words bigotry and tolerance or intolerance. Because we've seen a real change in the way those words are being used in our society. Um, if, if someone, as the church does, dares to suggest that your gender is determined by your sex, or you're male or female, and it's not up to you to decide or whatever you feel today to determine what your gender is. Um, and if, if, as the church says, same-sex acts are immoral, that they're disordered, or that marriage is the permanent and exclusive union of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, to say those things, very often you run the risk of being called an intolerant bigot. Uh, uh, someone who hates others, or the word that's often used, a homophobe, a homophobe, someone who is afraid. Phobia is, a, is the fear from the Greek word, and homo is the word of, uh, a, 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 for a, man, a person uh, or a man, but uh, it primarily means a, a fear of homosexuals, a, a fear of that inclination that is in part of people. So you run the risk of being called an intolerant bigot, and the church has been. Uh, and in some parts of the world, just teaching and preaching on the part of deacons, priests, and bishops, the traditional teaching of the church, which comes 
from Christ, from the Old and the New Testaments, um, has gotten into legal problems because it's illegal to say that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. Uh, so let's look at what, how, how that came about. You know, traditionally, the, the word to bigotry, you know, say someone is guilty of bigotry, it means an intolerance toward those who hold a different opinion from my opinion. Now notice, an intolerance of the person. Now here's that distinction again. Right? Bigotry, traditionally, the meaning of that word was, I'm intolerant of you because I disagree with your opinion or your beliefs, right? the way you're thinking, the way, the way you see things. Um, that's an intolerance of the other person. That's the traditional meaning. Not an intolerance of the person's beliefs or opinions, but an intolerance of the person himself or herself. Right? So bigotry is not simply disagreeing with what someone else believes. It's the unwillingness to accept the person who holds those beliefs. But that's changed. That's changed. And the word bigotry now is often used when we disagree not with the person, but with what the person is thinking, what the person is saying. That's not bigotry. It's, uh, the, the, the word has been redefined, just as the word tolerance has been. The, the traditional meaning of tolerance has, has two aspects to it. To be a tolerant person, it means I respect the right of the person in question to express their beliefs. You have a right to say what you want to say. You have a right to believe what you want to say. And I have a right to disagree, both privately and publicly, with the beliefs that you uh, hold. Okay? Once again, there's a very, the, the traditional notion of tolerance, there's a clear distinction between the person who holds the beliefs and the beliefs themselves. So to be tolerant meant that I respect you. I respect your right to believe and say what you're saying. I disagree with what you're saying or with what you believe. That's the meaning of tolerance. But over the last decades, that traditional understanding of tolerance, just as the traditional understanding of bigotry, has been transformed. And so now, one accepts the existence of the other e e beliefs while rejecting them as, as false. That was the, the traditional meaning. The novel new, the new meaning of tolerance is that all beliefs are uh, equally valid and true and you accept not just the other person but you accept as true what he or she believes, what he or she is feeling, what he or she, and if you don't then you are intolerant. Um, the, the, that, the problem with this new notion of tolerance is that it equates the person with his or her beliefs. So to reject as false what you're saying, or what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and I should be able to do that, is also in the new meaning of tolerance to reject the person. And, and that's a very unfortunate because it rests on the fact that there is no objective truth. And we've already said that that's part and parcel of uh, who we are as church, as believers in scripture, as Catholics, that we know, we can know the truth and it's been revealed to us through creation and through God's word uh, in scripture. Uh, the, the problem in equating uh, the person and the belief is to say that then there is no objective truth. Your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas are just as valid as mine. And my ideas and my thoughts and my feelings are just as valid as the church's. There's nothing that's objective or outside of ourselves. And to reject someone's belief or someone's feelings is to reject the person who holds that belief. That's the new understanding of tolerance, and it's a great problem. It's a great problem because uh, anyone who stands up for the church's teaching, anyone who says, no, we believe this is true and this is false, is seen to be rejecting the person. And that gets us back really to today's topic. Now, why is the church anti-gay people? The church is not anti-gay people. The church respects persons with homosexual inclination. The church rejects, as immoral, homosexual behavior. One final thought, and then I'd like to open this up for our, our discussion, and that is, and the catechism goes on in that section regarding the Sixth Commandment, um, to say that uh, homosexual people uh, like all people, 
are held to chastity, uh, the virtue of purity. So despite these inclinations, it doesn't give one the license to behave in that fashion. No more than it does me or those who are heterosexual, the free license to behave heterosexually. The church teaches very clearly that's disordered, that's immoral. Uh, to enjoy the fullness of the intimate union of a man and woman is only legitimate, is only proper in the state of marriage, where the two have pledged their entire future to each other in a permanent, exclusive, life-giving union. And uh, then marital chastity kicks in and the two are able to enjoy the beauty of human sexuality and human uh, sexual love in the context of their marriage. But apart from that, the church says the same thing about heterosexuals as it does about homosexuals. We're called to live a chaste life, to be pure, and to, by God's grace, with God's help, to um, avoid acting on our sexuality um, um, apart from marriage. I, I think that's also important to consider because somehow when someone identifies themselves as same-sex attracted, they also claim the right to be able to act on that. And that's contrary to our, our Christian morality. Uh, we are all called to chastity, to live a chaste life. And so they're getting back to what St. Paul was talking about, the misconception that freedom is freedom to do what I want freedom to do what I feel is right, freedom to do what I think is right, whereas the more authentic, the true no, 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 notion of freedom is to do what God has revealed is right. And then we become truly free, we become authentically ourselves. With that, I, I'd like to open uh, the, uh, the lines here to um, comments, questions, uh, we have uh, about 25 minutes, 27 minutes. We have some questions from coming, anyone. Come, come around here so I can move the camera. It doesn't flip over. Where do you want to ride? Uh, Keep going. There you go. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi, how are you? What is your name? I'm Danny. I'm from Trinity High School. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, sure. My question is, are there any barriers within the church preventing persons with homosexual tendencies from entering the priesthood or consecrated life? From entering the priesthood or consecrated life. Um, th th there, was, there is a document regarding those who present themselves to be candidates for the seminary. Um, and, uh, and that states that deep-seated homosexual behavior excludes a person from um, uh, the priesthood or, or formation toward the priesthood. I really can't speak. I, I think uh, in certain cases, uh, religious life uh, might uh, have their own standards, their own uh, norms for accepting candidates. I, I, I only speak because uh, my area, I, I deal with the formation of men toward the priesthood. And let me just kind of break that open a little bit. So what I'm saying, those with deep-seated this isn't just a, a fleeting, uh, occasionally I feel this attraction, but someone who has a, a deep-seated same-sex attraction and who has had a history of behaving in that fashion uh, is not to be accepted for formation to the seminary. Uh, celibacy, which is required in the Latin church for priesthood, means that I renounce my right to marry and I make the donation of myself to Christ and his church in the service of Christ in priesthood. So both marriage and celibacy require self-donation. I, I give myself, the, the husband and wife give themselves to each other and uh, in a celibate lifestyle, I give myself, first of all, I renounce an option that I have as a male 
and that is to enter marriage. So I'm renouncing marriage with a woman and I am making a donation of myself to Christ and his bride, the church. That's a theological understanding of celibacy. If I am experiencing deep-seated homosexual desires, orientation, I really can't renounce marriage because I wouldn't marry anyway. I would not be. It, marriage properly understood in its Christian context. We, we now have the legalization of same-sex unions. That's been in the law of our land. Um, uh, so, uh, but in properly understood, uh, marriage for me would be to find the right woman and enter into a marriage with my bride. As a homosexual man, if I were, I would not be interested I would not be uh, directed uh, by my lifestyle to do that. And therefore, I can't actually promise celibacy. So I think that's the reason behind that restriction. So there, there, there are, uh, but once again, I think the language is important, deep-seated homosexual inclination. And, and, and each case, I think, would have to be looked at very carefully. And, Okay, but thank you for your question. I, I truly appreciate that. Anyone else? I can go on, of course, so <laughs> but I wanted to stop early because I thought we might have uh, questions here. Oh, What's here's someone. Our big David. Good. Yes, don't be afraid. I, as I said at the beginning, I know this, this topic has lots and lots of uh, feelings, emotions, experiences involved, so um, we can be as candid as, as uh, we can, please. This is McDevitt. McDevitt, if you have a McDevitt. question, unmute your microphone and stand so where I can see you. All I can see is your shoulder. Yeah, there, there you go. go. Hi there. <laughs> now, coming through loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Um, Good morning. My name Good. is Serena Seltzer. Good morning. Um, What's your name? Serena. 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 Selena. Serena. Welcome. Serena. Good morning. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, for those of us that have friends with homosexual inclinations, um, what would be a way to uh, address those um, with them, uh, with sensitivity, without losing that friendship? Um, you talked about that you don't want us accompany, or we shouldn't accompany someone down the wrong path. So what would be the way to direct them towards the right path without losing that friendship? Mm -hmm. I, I think um, at, at the level of, of your friendship with, with that person, uh, you're not encouraging the behavior, but you are accepting the person as your friend. And, um, I, I don't, it, it, and, and simply to let the person know that you, uh, you don't reduce her or him, if it's a male, uh, to uh, their sexuality. This, this, is, this is one aspect of the beauty of their human personhood and you recognize the beauty uh, in the other Which aspects one? as well. Right? And, and so you accept and I, I think that the, the it would be wrong to say, well, uh, to, to do anything that would encourage uh, your friend to uh, participate, to act out in a same-sex way, but uh, to uh, let them know your uh, friendship and uh, I, I don't think that, I don't think you have to take a stand. Uh, I, I don't know. Again, I, I, I'm, we're talking here totally in the abstract. Um, if a discussion comes up, you know, if you if the if your friend begins to discuss their lifestyle, um, I think uh, what you can do is speak the truth with love. Many times uh, we speak the truth without love. We try to use it as a hammer. Or you use it as a, a, a sledgehammer to beat someone into submission. And, and, and Jesus never did that. He, he stood firm, but he always, he, he respect, he got angry on occasion too, it seems, with those who were so critical of him and his opponents. But nevertheless, in a, a situation with your friend, I think uh, if the topic comes up to be discussed, I would say you try to speak honestly as you represent uh, the, the church's position, if, if you can do that. Uh, but always with love and respect for, for your friend. So I, I would say accompanying them in the ways of friendship uh, wouldn't be leading them away from Christ, but when the occasion occurs, if, if the occasion, the opportunity presents itself, 
than to speak to them um, honestly from 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 your own uh, feelings your your own your own thoughts. I, I don't think it's your job really to you can witness to to your your faith to the church, uh, but I don't think you you don't have the obligation to turn the, the person around at this stage of life. And so okay. I, I would say continue in your friendship and try to model Christ's love, right? which is accepting, but a love that always wants the best. The great definition is that when, when we truly love someone, we want the best for that person. And there's so much evidence, and I know, I'm, I'm sure you may know people who are of a homosexual inclination, who, who are happy, who seem to be uh, uh, healthy and happy, but there's so much evidence that um, this doesn't lead to lasting happiness. It doesn't lead to human fulfillment. And if love wants the best for your friend, if your true friendship means willing the best for them, then you'd like that person to be authentically happy, you know, to be fully human uh, in according to God's plan for us. And so praying for that, pray, praying that, that God will kind of uh, enlighten your friend and, and help them, and, and praying that if they need help in this, if they are dissatisfied, that that person will see. If, so if you were to have a conversation with your friend and they say, I'm, I'm really sad my, uh, the, my friend who was uh, you know, same-sex attracted also ha has now gone to someone else, and I'm really sad. Well, maybe that little crisis would be an opportunity to say, why don't you go see Father Soames, or why don't you go see the school counselor? Uh, why don't you talk to uh, someone about it? So I think that's setting them in the right direction. Okay, is that, that helpful a little bit? Yes, Good. thank you thank, so much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So of Lancaster Catholic, hi there. How do you go about disagreeing with people in authority when you notice that they're coming from a hateful or uncompassionate standpoint? Oh, good. Good. Well, I, and I, I think uh, that, as you heard very clearly here, um, is not the church's position. So just as clearly as, as we would disagree with the behavior of someone with homosexual inclination, the church disagrees with the behavior that shows hate or true bigotry in the real meaning, that, that they don't just uh, disagree with the opinions, the feelings, or the behavior. They, dis they, they disrespect the person. That's real bigotry. I reject the person who holds these opinions. Um, you have to say that, that that's immoral too, right? Jesus calls us to, and in fact, Paul at the beginning here, he cited the second great commandment as fulfilling all the commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus reduced all of the law and the prophets, <clears throat> which is a great body of sacred literature uh, for the Hebrew, the Torah and the prophetic books, the scriptures, to love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. St. Paul, in talking to the Galatians uh, about freedom, said that you fulfill the commandments by loving your neighbor as yourself. So I think you can point out to this person in authority or this family that seems to be hateful toward any person that this is so contrary to the gospel and contrary to the love of Christ. Right? Um, we, we generally, we're not going to bring anyone to conversion uh, by such a vehement opposition. Uh, you know, if, if, if you think of times that you've changed in your life, it's because someone, someone showed you love and they respected you and then showed you another way. And you're able to follow that because you're attracted by the love that that person has shown. So, so, so hatred, bigotry, uh, uh, even violence, uh, is, is it going to get us, get us anywhere? I, I would say take a firm stand that this is contrary to Christ's love and you, uh, we need to respect uh, those persons. We can disagree with the behavior, but you need to show respect and a, and a true regard for the human person. Is there a way that you would suggest going about it if it's not a Catholic person? Well, I, I don't because th it, my parents are not Catholic. Uh huh. Well, um, I, I think you know uh, the, 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 the Paul's letter to the Galatians wasn't written to Catholics. Uh, it, it should be God's inspired. Or, and I don't know. Are they Christian? Are, are your are, is your family Christian? 
Yes. Yes. But yeah. Well, then it, it, it's iffy. If, well, that's all right. None of us are perfect. Huh? Uh, we have not arrived yet uh, to the fullness of uh, God's grace, but we're, we're, we're all projects in, in, in you know, we're all work in progress, right? Um, but, I mean, if they are Christian to some extent, the New Testament is God's word to them. They're baptized, and this is not just something for Catholics. So the, the same teachings of Christ uh, apply to all the baptized. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I said earlier, there are two books God has given us. Human reason, if, if we really look at, at the human person and see the wonder, the mystery of every man, every woman, human reason itself would dictate that we owe respect to one another. Yeah. Um, you can conclude that stealing is wrong without the Bible, right? because you have a possession and now I deprive you of it. It's an offense against your dignity and it's an injustice because I'm taking what is yours to myself. You don't have to have the commandments to know that stealing is wrong. So just reflecting on the dignity, the beauty, the marvel, the wonder, the truth of a human person uh, without scripture should tell us that we should respect one another, yeah? that we should honor one another. Now, scripture brings it to a whole other level because the, you're not just the, the greatest thing that exists on the face of the earth as a human person. You are made in the image and likeness of God. We wouldn't know that without this, but that's the fullest truth. But even our reason alone, so even someone who is not a Christian at all or not a believer who is an atheist, in, in fact, there are many atheists who have a more profound respect for persons than a lot of believers do right? because they've really thought about it and they see the wonder of each, indivi each individual person. So what, whatever they believe, wherever they are, uh, you, I think you can gently, these are your parents, so you owe them respect. You, you respect the persons that they are, but at the same time, you can take, I think, a, a firm stand and say, you know, when you say those things, it really hurts me. It, it hurts my heart uh, because that person is made in God's image. And you can disagree all from morning till night with what they're doing or what they're saying, or what they're feeling, but you have to respect the person. You, you need to recognize, right, thank you, Bishop. recognize their dignity. And I think if you say that with love and patience, you've made your stand. You may not change. Our, our job isn't to change the world necessarily. It's, it's to be faithful to what Christ asks of us. Uh, if, if we're quiet for a minute, if someone think about a question, but I'd like to just uh, go to uh, one other um, theological, scriptural image um, re regarding marriage and family. We've talked about our, our, our Christian concept of marriage, uh, the union of one man and one woman in a communion of the whole of life right, that's faithful, exclusive, and life-giving. Um, for us, and I, I want to read from a, a beautiful letter that St. John Paul II wrote. He wrote a letter to families it's not like it's really big, it's, it's fairly long. I'm just going to read a couple sentences. But he, he, he drills down on the idea that the family is a reflection, an icon of what Jesus revealed about God, that God is a community of persons, huh? that God doesn't just live in splendid solitude from all eternity, but rather God himself is a family, a, a, a community of three persons and yet one God. So um, let me just read this. In the light of the New Testament, it is possible to discern how the primordial model of the family, right, the most fundamental, the primordial model of the family is to be sought in God himself, in the Trinitarian mystery of his life. The divine we, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the divine we is the eternal pattern of the human we, especially of that we formed by the man and the woman created in the divine image and likeness and their children. So I heard this said just a few weeks ago. When you look at a family, a mother, a father, a child, or their children, it's like looking at a selfie of God. 
Right? God has taken a selfie in every family. And you can't have that image with two women who are in a civil union or two men in a civil union. Yes, they can adopt, and yet it's not the same. It's not the same generation um, uh, of, of, of life within that community of love. That's not to say anything about an adopting couple of a husband and a wife, a man and a woman who adopt and bring that child into the circle of their love. But um, when, when, we look, when we look at a family with a husband and a wife and a child, that's like looking at a selfie of God. So, so I think we have someone with a question. At Lancaster? Hi. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. You said that, uh, you said that um, someone on this path can't, that it's not going to find them freedom or happiness, but most people who go on this path end up finding their truest form of love and end up being their happiest and their freest then. And I just want to know what you thought of that. Well, I, I, I am sure, I, I, I said that I am, I'm sure that there are those who um, find happiness and, and feel that they are fulfilled in a same-sex attractive relationship. I am saying, however, it's not the fullest. It, it isn't what God has intended for us. It doesn't fulfill um, the... the uh, uh, the, the dignity uh, that God has written into us. I, I've used before, I think, in the, the, this word theographic, uh, the idea that God has written his image and likeness into each person. And uh, that fullness of giving oneself and receiving from the other, that reciprocity that's written into the human body, it's written into the male body, it's written into the woman's body, and the union of those is, is the fullest idea of self-donation and receptivity, of mutuality. And no matter how hard you try, it can't happen with same-sex attraction or behavior. Uh, that fulfillment isn't there. Um, I think statistics show, and counselors would know much better than I, but uh, the, the, the idea of the uh, vulnerability of these relationships I know there have been relationships that have lasted 20, 30, 40 years, but I see them more as the exception. I get the privilege every year of celebrating for maybe 80 or 100 couples their 50th wedding anniversary, and there are a lot of breakups of marriage, and for many, many different reasons. But the stability of the woman and man union in marriage is, is much greater than the stability of same-sex couples. Um, and a tragic thing, and I, we didn't even get really to discuss the topic, it wasn't my intention, but the whole notion today of transgenderism, of taking your assigned birth sex and changing it chemically and surgically, the outcomes of those in 10 and 20 years are absolutely tragic. 20 times the suicide rate, 20 times the rate of depression for people who have had that done. And yet we don't really read about that. We read about someone's right because I feel like a woman in a man's body, then I want to change my physical being to match my feelings. And hospitals who were the pioneers in doing that surgery, the transgender uh, uh, sex re reassignment of, of sex, uh, have stopped because they've studied their patients who've had it done and it does not bring happiness, it does not bring fulfillment, in fact, the opposite. So uh, the right to do it, does someone have a right to do it? We'd say no, uh, but let's look at the outcome. Now, if you're doing something over and over and over again, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, yield the, the outcome that you were looking for. You'd think you'd stop and say, wait a minute, this doesn't work. But I think we're, at, we're, 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 we're going full speed ahead over a cliff because the evidence is there that in most cases it doesn't work, and yet let's continue to do it and see if it turns out differently. Um, so I, I, uh, my, my point is that there certainly are couples who have uh, entered into this lifestyle and find it fulfilling and, and, and they are happy with it. I, I believe that, but I said there's something else that could be held out that has been held out to them by Christ 
and uh, I, they're invited uh, to look for another way, uh, another lifestyle, which would bring them, I believe, ultimate um, happiness and fulfillment. But thank you for that comment, the question. Um, we might have time for one more. For someone. Oh, do you, have, do you have more? Yeah. Oh, please. <laughs> for someone who's went into a heterosexual relationship and didn't find their happiness, but then found it even more in a homosexual relationship, what's that? What's to do with that? And also, the relationships between two people, um, I don't think just varies on their gender of what of their success, but of the person and who they are. Because there's a number of heterosexual marriages that end or go poorly, and there's also numbers of hetero or homosexual relationships that go poorly, but it might not be because of the gender, but rather the people who are in it. Yeah, and, and there we get to a very subjective issue. Huh? What, what made this uh, heterosexual marriage fail? Uh, what made this homosexual union uh, fail? Uh, the, the ingredients there are subjective to the couple and their circumstances. Right? I'm just saying that not at a subjective level, but at an objective level. level. That the, the, the mutuality that God intends for the human person who enters a marriage can never be achieved with the same-sex union. It just doesn't happen. He's designed our bodies for that complementariness, to be complementary, male and female. Two women's bodies are not complementary. Two men's bodies are not complementary. They just aren't. Now you can say, I'm, I'm happy in this, but the whole notion even of generativity, right? That our love becomes, uh, for a husband and a wife, God willing it, their love becomes so intense that it's enfleshed in their child. Their marital love, their nuptial union is expressed now in a new person. And, and this is why family and marriage is an icon of the Trinity. Right? Husband, father, uh, the, the two giving themselves to each other, father and son, and the mutual love and receptivity of father and son from all eternity is the Holy Spirit the bond of love between father and son, the giving and receiving, perfect from all eternity. And that's imaged in the family. It can't be imaged in the same-sex union. And so if this, I believe this is God's plan for us, and we don't find ultimate happiness or satisfaction apart from what God uh, asks of us. Uh, again, I go back to a beautiful line from Dante's uh, 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 divine comedy. In his will is our peace. In his will is our peace. Our peace is not in my will. My, pa my fulfillment, my happiness is only when I give myself uh, to doing the will of God. And you have to ask yourself, are these couples who are same-sex attracted, living in same, are they giving themselves to God? Have they considered God's plan for humanity? and Christ's plan of salvation. Are, are these at all on their screen? Or is it simply, this feels good, it must be good? There's two mistakes in this. One person said, this feels good, I must be bad. When we know the church is teaching. And that's wrong. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sinning, I believe. But uh, because it feels good doesn't make me bad. It makes, makes me someone who needs to repent. But there are others who say, this feels good, it must be good. And that's, that's equally false. I rest my case. I think it's two minutes. Uh, thank you, though. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions from Lancaster. Thank you. You're very welcome. I, I'm very grateful for those, uh, your uh, questions and comments. All right, well, I think that brings us to a conclusion. Again, I, I, I want to thank Trinity for uh, being here this morning. And um, thank you all. I look forward to uh, next Wednesday, our final uh, session uh, for this Lenten series. So let's just conclude with glory be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and to the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.